All right, hi, I'm Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia. And I'm Eric Meyer, also a developer advocate at Egalia. And uh, today we're gonna do something interesting that I'm excited about. We have a, another guest from uh, Egalia. Hi, yeah, I'm Martin Robinson. I'm a software engineer at Egalia on the web platform team. And I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and the reason we invited Martin on is because uh, Martin is working on Servo. Uh, and today we're going to do one of two exciting shows. We're going to do sort of back to back uh, in this whole series on web ecosystem health. We had two presentations, novel engine presentations at the Web Engines Hackfest. We're going to talk about those today. Uh, well, we're going to talk about Servo specifically today. One of the things that I think is really interesting to tie into this is that several times over the course of these nine episodes that we had before, we've made reference to the fact that the three major engines are like tens of thousands of person years invested into, you know, cumulatively into them and how much they cost to maintain. And it means that you're way more likely to lose contenders than to gain them unless it's by evolution somehow, like by forking them. So I, people get real excited, including me, when somebody's talking about a new engine. So let's let's jump in and cut to some things about Servo. So when, when's the new Servo browser coming, Martin? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I wish I knew the answer myself. Um, well, maybe we should say, what what is Servo like? Oh, yeah. Well, where's, it, where's it come from? What's, what's it doing? What, mm -hmm. What's cool about it? Yeah, well, Servo is um, an experimental web browser engine that was created out of Mozilla Research in around 2012. And it's got a lot of novel features. The main thing, I guess, historically that's important is that Servo is sort of a co-project with Rust. In that moment, Rust was quite new and Servo was kind of like a way of trying Rust out and feeding feeding back into the Rust development process. And hmm. it also used a lot of Rust's uh, novel features in, in an effort to make the web better. For instance, Rust has type safety uh, hmm. much more than a language like C++. So it can guarantee through the type system memory safety. And also because of the way the type system works, it's also much easier to do things in parallel across different threads in a way that you can guarantee, make guarantees about the, the safety of the memory involved. So Rust has that type safety and it also uses, um, Servo also uses Rust's ability to, uh, to spread things over different threads to implement support for laying out a web page in parallel, which is something that no other web browser does even today, uh, except in very minor cases. Okay, so it, it has, Rust basically manages all of the multi-threading for you as a programmer, is that? Yeah. Uh, well, Rust. There's d different ways of using of using Rust across different threads, different libraries. For instance, we use something called Rayon to spread work <laughs> across threads. But all of these build on top of Rust's uh, Rust type system, which allows using uh, using different primitives like structs and data structures uh, in a way where you can be sure that. They aren't uh, that you aren't um, losing them or leaking them or writing into memory that doesn't exist anymore, that sort of thing. You did work with Rust and Servo before this as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have been involved with Servo off and on since I want to say 2014, um, for stre like stretches of time between six months and a year. Uh, so I've had a good window into the, the evolution of both Rust and, and Servo through the years. Yeah. So at some point, I am i don't actually know the date. Like, I'm trying to think from my memory, maybe 2018? Uh, maybe you know. But there was an effort that was, like, codenamed Quantum mm -hmm. that took lots of things from this project and moved them into, like, Firefox proper, right? Yeah, that's right. So essentially, Servo was a research project. So there were a lot of things that weren't, let's say, fully baked going on. But some things were were very productive when they were being made. And it was clear that they were an excellent idea and could potentially represent a huge speed up to the way uh, 
that Firefox worked at the time. Uh, for instance, one of those would be the style system, which in Servo was written in a way that it was completely uh, parallel as well. So before in a browser like Gecko, if you wanted to style the, to style the page, you had to, to do it serially and, and not spread the work over different cores, whereas Rust allowed you to do it uh, in parallel. And that also goes for things like selector matching. And those bits of Servo that were really successful, let's say style, and then also this part called Web Render, which is a rasterization engine for web content, were essentially bolted on to Gecko, and that became the, the source of development for those, those parts of Servo. And they're still there today. Um, and it's one of the reasons why Quantum was a lot faster when it came out, in addition to some other non-Servo related things, like I believe like electrolysis and uh, uh, compositor thread. But then in 2020, uh, Mozilla handed over that research project to the Linux Foundation. That's right, yeah. And it it's really interesting because in 2012-ish, there was just a lot of excitement. And I looked back at the the repo and it, it's had hundreds of contributors. I mean, like any open source project, there are like a much smaller group of Herculean contributors, right? Like that contribute a lot all the time. Mm -hmm. Presumably, mostly those are paid people who are working on it, you know, for their work. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's definitely slowed down until we picked it back up in February with uh, some some new funding for the work. I think we would love to find some more funding for the work <laughs> because it is still a relatively small team, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that's that was always one of the, the things about Servo that was quite special. In an open source project, you can have contributors, but you really need really good community management to make that work. In Servo, from its conception, had really great community management. I think those two things, community management and lots of excitement about the project, is really what drives contributions. Because even if you have the excitement and you're not managing that excitement properly, there can be a lot of people who just get frustrated and leave. Uh, they'll go work on some other open source project. Um, but if you manage the community well and you're able to shepherd contributions in and make it so that people feel like they're actually doing something interesting and contributing code, then it builds up a sort of this snowball effect of, of community contributions. And that's something that Servo always did really well. Yeah. So, so Servo right now is like wholly separate from Mozilla, but I, as I understand, I don't, I mean, I don't know a lot about Servo actually, but as I understand, it's also like more modular than in its design than the other engines. Is that? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, the different parts of Servo are separated into these things called crates, which are essentially a, a module in the Rust world. And these are, generally speaking, separate realms of concern. And that's sort of why, even today, even though Servo is separate from Mozilla, Gecko is still using those parts of Servo that, uh, that were shared with Servo. So there's still some links between Gecko and Servo, even though the two are completely separate. So if there are updates mm -hmm. in our project that would benefit, will they pull those down? Is that an easy thing to do? Typically speaking, what happened with the parts of Servo that went into Gecko was that a lot of the development work, those became part of Gecko's mono repo. And, a lot of, and almost all the development work on those is happening in Gecko's repository. So essentially what happened was there was a moment where for Gecko, the upstream was Servo but it flipped so that now for Servo, it's upstream for those particular modules is Gecko. Oh, okay. And, so um, so the, the inverse is true, really. If, if those get improvements in Firefox, mm -hmm. then the other project can, can get them, take advantage of them. Yeah, and that's actually one of the things that we're working on right now is to, to resync with the work, all the work that's been done in Gecko. And we're already finding places where this is going to to help Gecko in a way, because, because we're using the crate in a slightly different way, which exposes maybe some shortcomings that can be corrected. Or um, maybe because of the way server was designed, there's a new opportunity for Gecko to, to have a future optimization.
That's a really excellent thing to hear because, um, like, just to be to throw another layer into this, like there are only three, let's call them ready to compete on everything engines, right? Mm -hmm. um, that you can power a browser with and it, it can be really, really competitive on everything. And, you know, when we're looking to fund work on these novel engines, there is, well, how do you fund it, right? And then to me, there's a question of like, well, boy, I want to fund, like, if I could give money to all these projects, like, should I give my money to Mozilla for Firefox or should I give it to Servo for this? And, like, understanding that they're, like, related in that way is, I think, really, really helpful. So you could, you could kind of balance that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, as far as funding goes, it's a... It's really a question of what you're looking for. The way I see it, a project like Servo is is a more long-term bet for the future, whereas Gecko is something that you can use right now. And like you said, it's ready to use, ready to compete. But when you're looking at the far, at the further into the future, something like Servo has, has a lot of potential. Um, but it, again, there's more risk too that comes along with that because it's unclear like where the future will take it. Just because of it, of its novelty in the way it does things, I think it, it has a, a great promise as well. I, I think that that interplay between Firefox and Servo helps. Am I, am I wrong that it, that sort of helps that a little bit? Like you can feel like if you are investing in Servo, it's not only in Servo necessarily, like some of it would be obviously um, maybe even most of it, but it does have the potential to benefit even Firefox, right? Like, Yes, it that exists, uh, I suppose, with any web engine in the sense that when you work on a web engine, you you run into specification, corners of the specification that aren't completely fleshed out, fleshed out yet. So in general, <laughs> this is a, a thing that happens when you're implementing the web for the first time in an engine. You almost always run into to bugs in the spec or places where it's unclear what the spec means and you write a test and you, and then gradually all the other engines come to an agreement about that test, even though the, the question started in the minor engine. And I think you're right that there's even more chance for, let's say collaborative enhancement in an engine like Servo, just because it shares so much with Gecko and there's potential to share more things in the future, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So Eric, you found that amusing. Yeah, I had to chuckle a little bit at the, you know, the observation about specs. Is, are you implying that the specifications are sometimes underspecified? <laughs> I'm shocked. Shocked, I tell you. Right. Surely such a thing is. Yeah. No, but I mean, it's, it is an interesting point that coming to some of the specif specifications, excuse me, uh, you know, fresh and not having necessarily you know existing code to adapt but code to implement um in 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 order to support a specification is a is a useful check on the clarity and correctness and completeness of specifications so things like servo or you know other <clears throat> new browser engines minor engines if we want to call them that is is a is a useful sort of a, uh, I shouldn't say unit test, <laughs> but it's sort of like a test for those parts of the specifications. You know, if someone comes in and they don't have twenty year old or thirty year old parsing code that they're just trying to graft new stuff onto, does it like is this specification complete enough that you can? you can implement and not run into, you know, questions or ambiguities or whatever. And I, it, it's interesting to hear that because people generally don't think about that. I, I think, um, yeah. you know, they, they figure, Oh, well, you know, browser engines, they just add new stuff, but don't necessarily consider that they're adding stuff to code. That's probably many, many, staff turnovers before the person who's actually doing the implementation, they have this whole code base 
that they don't necessarily have complete intimate knowledge of. They just, they, they have tests and rather than having to write all the whole thing, rewrite the whole thing from scratch, they just, they're adding a little bit, they're modifying what's already there, but that's not the case with, with minor engines. Yeah. I have to say the experience has been pretty enlightening from the perspective of someone implementing essentially the basics of CSS2 again, mm -hmm. you know, not in 2005 or whenever. Um, <laughs> or, I mean, on one 1997. hand, 1997, yeah. Uh, on one hand, uh, there are, we've, we've even, you know, found bugs in, in newer specifications or maybe like corner cases that aren't mm. explained properly. And we've opened, we've like, we've opened bugs on the Flexbox specification recently. Mm. Um, but also as someone who's worked mainly on implementing specifications that are a bit newer, it's interesting how much of CSS2 is just not specified still. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. There is a lot of. For instance, two things that we're working on now, which are big, big chunks of work are floating content and tables. And these are two parts of the CSS2 specification, which in general floats are pretty good, but there's a lot of times where it's just like, do this to make it do that in the specification where you kind of, you kind of have to make up what that means inside your engine. And then for tables, <laughs> I think it's just, there's just no specification for how table layout is supposed to work top to bottom. To recall to earlier episodes, uh, I know I've heard this in many, many conversations. I think it was said about uh, Microsoft uh, in the in the one with the previous episode with uh, Rick Byers and Rawson. And I definitely recall it being in the one with the opera folks. Uh, so uh, how come and Vadim and Bruce Lawson that the trick, like they, they both were, you know, very mainstream, very, very competitive browsers. They said that the, basically they would have a, a bug line, right? Um, and like open bugs and closed bugs, right? And like the goal is to get those two to meet, right? Like, so mm -hmm. all the open bugs are closed. And they said you could watch it with a graph over time. And just even if you had a hundred people working on it, they would just continue to get further and further apart because there is so much in web browsers that is just, it has to work and it's still just not written down accurately. And I think a lot of that stuff is still um, probably some of the, the earlier stuff, no matter the fact that we have had so much focus on it. If nobody's building new engines, you, you're just going to hit a point where other engines have managed to reach really high degree of interoperability on those already. And it's still not in the specs, right? So I, I think it's really key if we ever want, like basically every engine that you add that exercises those things fresh makes it easier for the next one in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I agree. And I, I think that there are some that are like pretty good. Like the HTML5 parser, I think is really, really strictly specified and, um, there are not many problems with that. Like I've heard people have been able to implement that like pretty easily. Um, but it's hard to say because if they're not exercising the whole web, then they won't get the complaints. Right. Mm, right. Um, but yeah, let's talk about like exercising the whole web and what, like what we talk about when we're like these, like sort of the three main premier <laughs> ready to fully compete engines. And these novel engines, like what, what is the gap? I mean, we said that it was started in 2012 and it's had hundreds of contributors and, you know, it should be shipping at what time today, <laughs> you know, like well, how close is it and how close isn't it and why? Right. So I think it's, it's quite far from being something that could be used as a general purpose engine. And the reason is, I think that for many years, it was just essentially a test bed for Mozilla, Mozilla's research arm. And this means that there was never a huge focus on making it ready to be a replacement for Gecko so much as a way to test out new ideas that could be used in Gecko. Uh, and it's only now that when we examine Servo and we decide to work on it, we maybe we choose a different path where we 
we want Servo to be more of a general purpose web engine. And there's a lot of work to do to get there. And there's different phases of that work. For instance, you start out and you, you implement what the specification says, you start making web pages look better, but then you begin to run into problems with things like correctness of the DOM APIs and making sure that events are delivered in the same order as you would expect other browsers to deliver them in. Even something as simple as when you resize an iframe, the events that bubble up from the resizing of that iframe happen in the right order, the main frame, that kind of, that kind of thing. And then even once you get to that point, even once the correctness is right, then you need to make a usable web engine, which means that it's performant and that there's no weird lag when you do things. And also that, you know, when you go to a page, uh, things load and work when you click on them. And that phase is actually quite large as well. Um, and then even once you get to that phase, then you have to keep up with all of the new features that are added to the web. Yeah. The one benefit, I guess, from the perspective of Servo is that because it's been around for some time, it has support for some of the new features that other web engines had to gain over time. So it has some advantages, but there's still a lot of work to do to get to the point where you can you know, pop open Gmail or whatever in Servo and read your email. So what is the near-term goal? Do you want to talk about sure. that? Yeah. yeah, essentially the goal with the Servo project right now is to, to make it useful for contained embedded web applications. Mm -hmm. These are things that maybe you run in a little kiosk, um, in which case I think something like Servo really shines because it's it's got a lighter footprint than these other big engines. And there's a lot of opportunities for running mm, on any hardware that Rust supports. Can you build a electron like thing out of it, basically? I think you could, yeah. And then at that point, it's really like, is what's in the Electron app in line with what Servo provides? If so, then Servo might be a good fit. And when you say contained web you know, applications, does, are you basically saying offline or are you saying that, you know, the, it only really points to very specific things and you can't break out into the wider web? I think very much the latter servo servo should work just fine over the network. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of, will that content be something that servo can render properly? Can, can deal with, yeah. Well, if people build in progressively enhancing ways, then at least you'll get the content, but that's a whole other, <laughs> that's a whole other discussion. Um, so this is, I mean, what are a couple of use cases that, that Servo you think would be very good in? So I think Servo could be really useful right now for something like a little user interface for an embedded device. Like... What what kind of embedded device are we talking like about? Like a refrigerator? Yeah. For instance, I mean, okay. there's a lot of devices that basically embed just a tiny little web engine to show a small UI, um, household devices, things like that. Mm. Right now, I think Servo is a good fit for those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of experience with this from WP, WebKit, and uh, also from other Chromium embedding projects. So there's basically everything that you buy today, uh, cars, uh, refrigerators, digital signage, point of sale, rich climate controls. Yeah. It's like just about everything that you buy today is built on the web. Um, when we had the show with, uh, how come, uh, he, uh, is on the board of Prince XML, which has a rendering engine that's used mainly for print. Uh, Amazon internally main, maintains several engines for stuff like that. I know there was like also a Wheezy Print was another one. Mm -hmm. um, so there, like, there's many, many, many applications for different parts of web, you know, the web stack. And so I think the idea here is that we can make Servo very useful to segments of those and help build and grow it into more. So I think it would be probably not ready for 
um, prime time, just put a browser shell around it. But probably lots of those other cases it would be great for, actually. Yeah, when you say a smaller footprint, do you, like, are there sort of numbers that can go with that? <laughs> uh, we don't have numbers now, but in general, Servo is a smaller browser engine than both uh, Chromium and WebKit. Mm. I mentioned this uh, idea on uh, Egalia Chats with um, how come in, in that episode. I, do you think that people would use like a browser that defaulted to reader mode? Maybe only even supported reader mode. That is like a potentially interesting novel target if you could get some people to use it. I, I would almost be interested in building that myself with Servo mm -hmm. when it's to that point that you could do it. It, it seems like a much, much simpler bar you know mm -hmm. yeah but i brave actually is doing that you can like turn it on mm -hmm. i don't know if they like listen to the show but, or or <laughs> just like you know it, it was an idea that was just ready to be had mm -hmm. also like epub now i could see somebody doing something really interesting with that that none of the browsers are working on doing microsoft was but they stopped when when they became edgium Mm -hmm. But I wonder, like, do you see that those are kind of like possibilities of potential novel use cases for servo, that kind of thing? Or Yeah, I suppose any kind of feature w which is a limited view of the web, where you don't need things to work exactly how they do in a full-fledged browser, could be a good target for servo something like reader mode or even like a browser that's focused just on accessibility. Um, I think those things are, are really interesting use cases that are really underexplored. Wow. The a browser focused on accessibility just kind of blew my mind. Um, like we do have today where you have a browser and it also supports like, you know, different kinds of accessibility, but it, it has the accessibility tree, by the way, um, if you want to go back and listen to a previous episode, we did a whole show on accessibility and, uh, I had a really good guest. His name was Martin Ross. So. <laughs> Sounds like uh, a, a nice guy. <laughs> yeah. He was a good guy. Good guy. Um, uh, but it was a really good show. You, I think you were the second show we ever did, but I, I enjoyed it a lot and I learned a lot, but you, you're kind of blowing my mind with that as an idea that like, why is it that you need sort of like a web browser and a screen reader, for example, could we just not build you a web browser that is a screen reader? Like mm -hmm. that's a, I mean, I've never heard of anything like that, but I mean, it, w it would work for a, a very specific set of people, you know, but for, for a very specific set of people that maybe would be really interesting and you, maybe you could get a higher quality somehow. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. know. That's you're making me think now. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, if you're not pushing pixels to the screen at 60 frames a second or more, the battery life that you can get from a browser would be much better. When you say much, you mean much, much, much. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, a, another person that I like to quote sometimes is uh, Eric Meyer. <laughs> and he... Who? Uh, <laughs> I love the thing that uh, you said about uh, browsers are 60. Well, how, how does the quote go? Like, They're first person scrollers. First person scrollers, right. Because they have the same frame rate constraints that, you know, Doom Eternal or whatever the latest right. video game is. These these AAA video games, are there, they all have to maintain, or they're all supposed to maintain 60 frames per second or more. And web browsers have the same constraint, which is another thing that still, I mean, I'm used to it now, but it still kind of blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a really good point about that. That is exactly what I was thinking is like the, the 60 frames per second constraint or goal. It's not a like, mm. well, I mean, it's a constraint in terms of landing new features, at least with it's most a constraint in terms of our designs. Like we design features so that it's possible to do that. Um, Right. I mean, that was one of the things that Blocked has for a while was that no one had found a way to do it and maintain 60 frames per second because of the performance hit. Right. So it's anything that will cause a performance hit deep enough that 
the browser's rendering lowers below 50, 60 frames per second, like the Chromium and WebKit and Gecko teams are not going to accept it. Right. So, I, yeah, I mean, it's just kind of blowing my mind that, like, sometimes you don't need, sometimes you might not need to render anything. And, mm -hmm. and I wonder if there's just, like, a if there are interesting benefits to that, right? Like, but you know, like I frequently have wanted, uh, basically a browser on the server, you know, like a programmatic browser. There are a few things, but none of them are particularly great in my experience. You might not need to actually render something. Having something that had like a relatively light footprint and you could do sort of modularly is maybe interesting in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can people like try it in some way to like examine the progress and, and think about whether it would work for them for applications? Like I know like way back there was like a mini browser basically in the nightly build. Maybe we should explain like the concept of a mini browser. Yeah. So when you're implementing a web engine, you often need to test it and you usually don't test this in a full browser shell. There's usually a small application, which oftentimes just has the web view as the main control, or sometimes it has the web view in a, maybe a URL bar to load new URLs. And Servo is not different in this respect. It has a little browser application, which essentially embeds the Servo web view as the main control. Uh, it has no UI outside of the browser itself. So currently there's no way to say, type in a URL to go there. Although we do have plans to implement something like that. And you can try it out uh, in the same way you mentioned, just by downloading the Nightly and running it on your machine. Does the Nightly, well, with the Nightly, you could launch, say, like Google or DuckDuckGo or something like that, and then search your way there. <laughs> I mean, it's almost a wonder bar at that point, right? Yeah, I guess so. I, I have to say, though, that like right now, it's probably pretty broken because we're just switching to a new layout engine. Yeah. Um, and probably uh, it's not going to look great when you download Servo at that moment. Sure. I, but I find that like it's really interesting to like interrogate it a little bit mm -hmm. um, and look at like what it does and doesn't do or have or whatever. There are so many parts to a web engine, right? Um, there is, uh, like you say, the, the selector engine, basically like CSS matching um, that has to happen. And then there is layout and there's rendering and there's a javascript engine and there has to be something that coordinates all this um and then there are so many things that are potentially implemented like one of my favorite examples like web speech right like that's not uh, something that you see on every website but you have it there web audio and web rtc <laughs> there's so many things like what parts of those would be a part of servo and what wouldn't so servo is kind of funny i think it's probably the only browser engine with a high speed rasterizer that doesn't have full support for css2 <laughs> um so it is kind of a mixed bag uh, in a lot of ways um just because of its experimental nature so for instance even though we're working on this new layout engine with you know adding support for basic css features Servo does, on the other hand, support things like WebGPU, uh, WebGL. Amazing. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit strange, um, but that's really just due to the the way that Servo was was used as this research and development platform. I don't think anything is necessarily out of scope for Servo. Um, I think even though we're focused on this embedded test case, mm -hmm. I think it's also still a good place to experiment with novel implementations of web technology just because it's new and it's a place where you can do a thing and still make huge changes to the way things work. And probably it will be a progression and not a three year long project. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think Servo, nothing's off the table for Servo, even though our focus is on the basics right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's just like, if you go to like the index of can I use, it's just, you know, miles long features. Right. Um, and it's interesting to think about like what they have and what they don't and what's like really important when. So like, I've seen people post things about like their 
you know, engine that is rendering a, a certain amount of things, but like rendering is only one, one part, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's really, it can get really complicated. And so many things can can sort of bring it down. I, I don't know if I told this story before, but like also related to the degree to which things are specified, like one of the earliest things when I got involved in actually engaging in standards was a discussion in uh, ECMA came out of that with the understanding that properties in JavaScript had like if you were to like iterate over them, they would iterate in all engines in insertion order. Right. Almost without disagreement in everything that you could throw at it. But the spec said there is no order. And Java at the time did the same. Like it said, there is no order. But when Java decided to change that, uh, people had to build and compile and test. And they, they found out that things were broken because of that. But uh, I think Opera or Chrome tried to change that for performance reasons, they found that if you don't have to maintain insertion order, which the spec says you don't, then we can run faster. And uh, doing so broke Gmail and a bunch of other major sites because they had learned to depend on that you can do that. And that doesn't mean you can't necessarily render Gmail, right? Like you probably could render it, but it just won't work. Yeah, there's a thousand of those things for sure. Yeah, yeah, and they're everywhere. I imagine Canvas is is in there. Mm -hmm. Is Canvas one of those things that would, like where is the split in Canvas between Firefox and Servo? Like, I think Firefox is just shipping right now off-screen Canvas. Mm -hmm. So do we get that for free in Servo or? No, unfortunately not. Almost everything that involves a DOM API mm -hmm. has to be implemented again. Uh, one part of Servo that is shared, which I didn't mention before, is the JavaScript engine. Mm -hmm. So essentially, Servo is is using SpiderMonkey under the under the covers to to run JavaScript. But there's this whole layer of the DOM, which sits essentially all the implementation of the DOM sits on top of the JavaScript engine is implemented in native code. So in Servo, that's all implemented in Rust, whereas in Gecko, it's implemented in C++. So we have to re-implement those as well. And then for Canvas, it's a special case too, because not only is it a DOM API, but it actually is also a vector rasterization engine. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, Gecko and Servo do um, completely differently. They share a web content rasterizer but the vector rasterizer is is different. Fascinating. <clears throat> is there a particular guide to when things should be shared or not shared, or it's just that's how it developed? I think that's just how it developed. Um, the The reasoning is probably just that. Well, <laughs> this is actually a very interesting tangent about about GPU rasterization of graphics. But in general, CSS is much easier to rasterize on the GPU than a vector than <laughs> canvas, which is why, really? yes, which is why, huh. um, because it's only squares and rectangles and rounded rectangles, essentially, and text. And this is why, this is why, um, the CSS engine, the CSS rasterizer in, in servo was good enough to be shared. It's just that it's, it's fast in all the cases. Whereas as far as like a general purpose vector rasterizer vector being like you have a path on your canvas and you're trying to rasterize it, that's a much harder task for a GPU to do. Um, and <laughs> Servo does have a GPU rasterizer for canvas that it uses, but maybe it's not as fast as the CPU version in all the cases. So I sus suspect that most web browser, web browser engines at the moment are choosing at runtime, what sort of rasterization strategy to use for canvases? Yeah, that's just, it's, that's so fascinating to me that uh, weird uh, that you would say that CSS is easier to rasterize on the GPU than vector stuff because what, what we always hear and what I had internalized is that like vector stuff is math, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, effectively, you know, vector graphics are math and GPUs are supposed to be super, super good at math. Mm 
but CSS is, I mean, yes, there's math involved, but it's a whole lot of, there's text and there's mm -hmm. boxes and it's not like this purely mathematical thing. And yet that's faster on GPUs. I absolutely would have assumed the other way around. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, but it, a web page looks really complicated, but again, it's just mm -hmm. like a series of rounded rectangles and some rectangles that have images, which are essentially textures applied to them. So all of the different characters on your page are, are just different pieces of a texture that's uploaded to the GPU. So wow. in the end, it just it just fits a lot better with the way GPUs work. Whereas like a vector rasterizer needs to worry about things like winding rules and compositing operations, which um, just, just mean that it's, uh, it can be a lot harder to do. Wow. Today I learned. <laughs> That's uh, seriously. I mean, I had no idea that that was how that worked. Like my entire view of that part of the web has been literally inverted. I mean, I think you, you took less time than the rest of the, the web development community, the web platform development community, because it's taken us like a decade and a half to, to learn this, I think. Well, but it's a lot easier for me because you can, you can tell me at that, you know, after that decade and a half, mm -hmm. here's what we found out. And I'm like, okay, you people are way smarter than I am individually and collectively. And so I could just accept that, but that, wow. Yeah. Um, mind is still blown. Well, it's going to be blown for the rest of the day, at least. That that's an interesting thing because I had in my notes, and this like ties it in pretty nicely. I'm not sure you did that on purpose or not, but like this thing that Eric just said, where like Eric can learn it in a few minutes because you could tell him, right? He didn't have to suffer through all the pains of a decade of people debating and talking and learning and making mistakes and finding improvements. And I I'm curious about the history here because like um it it came out of labs, and I think like. They were the first to, Serval was the first thing to reimagine some of this in a long time. Because like we said, uh, basically the only other engine has its roots in KHTML in the late 90s. Since then though, since 2012, uh, other engines have have been working on what they call their, like their next generation rendering engines. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering, like, do you think that they learned things from the servo effort, probably, and whether the reverse is true now? Because now we're coming in and, like, Layout NG has been completed. Uh, Layout NG learned a lot uh, from Edge HTML, their, their attempt. You know, there's work on better rendering engine stuff in WebKit as well. So um, are there opportunities there for us to learn from those and do more, more quickly and maybe better because we're not, we don't have to suffer through the same pains or are they just so different that it really, that's not a... That's an interesting question. I think if anything, the rest of the web browsers have become more similar to Servo as time has gone on. Um, Servo sort of pioneered a lot of things that web browsers do by default now, such as display lists or always using the GPU to render content. In that sense, I think that there, there are opportunities for learning from other engines because I think they are more similar. And even when it comes down to something like layout NG or some of the new layout work that's happening in WebKit, that even the layout engines look more similar to Servo. Um, essentially the, the fashion nowadays is something that Servo also does is when you implement layout, you implement it as close to the specification as possible. And even the data structures that you use in layout have the same name as it, as what's talked about in the specification. So there should be more or less a one-to-one -one mapping between concepts in the spec and in the code itself. So I think in that sense, there is this sensation of all of us being sort of on the same path. Um, and we can sort of look at the other engines and see what they're doing and compare it to Servo. And I mean, maybe uh, at some point the opposite will be true as well. Cool. Eric had asked 
about like when is the decision made like when was the decision made and why was the decision made about like which parts would servo would be the upstream or vice versa right and i'm curious there's a a second part of that question that i think is also interesting is like is there a possibility to reverse some of those decisions mm. so like in the future maybe in the future maybe the upstream of style would be in the server repository again mm -hmm. or or but vice versa as well like i, mm -hmm. I i'm it's not a loaded question i mean it could mm -hmm. go either way yeah um, i certainly like the idea that work in servo can benefit firefox and i also certainly like the idea that sometimes maybe development in firefox can lower the load toward making a really competitive engine um, but I don't know like where you draw that line or, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I think it would be tough for Gecko has a pretty serious culture of putting everything in the repository mm -hmm. and vendoring things in. So I think it would be hard to make it so that Gecko would take from the server repository or some shared repository directly. But I mean, we could probably imagine a future where there's just a lot of work on, say, the style crate from the outside, from both Servo and Gecko side, or some other smaller crate. And maybe in that case, uh, the work would happen in a shared repository or in Servo, and then Gecko might pull those changes down when they want them. Yeah, I think it could go either way. Um, as far as like taking things from Servo and that might become parts of Gecko again, I it could really depend. Um, I suspect that. There are cases where a Servo could be using a crate that's... Servo also has this constellation of crates that it, it uses, that it, it controls. And that's those are actually... Some of those are actually used by Gecko. Uh, and the upstream is still outside the Gecko repository. So I think there's lots of opportunities for that to, to continue to expand. Yeah, I think that would be like really, really great. Firefox itself, while a major browser, is a significant underdog. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, having these sort of like two underdog things, like helping each other somehow is I think really good. I mean, I know that there are people at Mozilla who will still contribute just because they love the project. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that also like we need people who are paid to work on it to <laughs> to make it actually get somewhere, it's really would be too much to hope to develop this with purely volunteer efforts. Like just managing the community itself mm -hmm. is a pretty significant yeah. undertaking. Mm -hmm. For sure. There's a lot of work that goes into a, a web engine. One of the really nice things that I think uh, <laughs> we have going for us with Servo is that um, it is already on web platform tests like you can actually select servo from the list and you can see the answer to those questions that i was uh talking about like what if you're curious like does it support thing x you can you can go in and mm -hmm. look and i mean it's not a small number of things it does <laughs> uh it there are like 1.7 to 1.8 million subtests there and it's passing 1.2, 1.3 million of them. So mm -hmm. pretty amazing, actually. Yeah. I mean, the web platform tests are something that I'm not super clear on the history of the web platform tests. But I know that in 2012, essentially... This... 1% in 2012, I think. 1%? It, it covered 1% of the existing web mm. platform in 2012. Yeah. 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 That sounds about right. So like yeah. at the beginning of the history of Servo, web browsers didn't really, I mean, the web platform tests were not a major part of working on a web browser. Um, but now it's basically, um, now if you run a new test for, for the web platform and it's not in the web platform tests, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a big red flag. Like, why isn't this there? Um, and it just it just made the whole process of working on a web browser much easier because not only are the tests there but they also represent like some 
shared understanding of what each engine does. Um, if they all pass the test and you don't, then you know that you know you're not in the consensus opinion about what should happen in this case. So yeah, web platform tests have really changed. Yeah, it's but, it's great. One of the things that we didn't talk about here, but is talked about in the talk that was at the Web Engine Attack Trust that uh, I would encourage people to go watch because it's just a great talk anyway. But um, there are like two different layout modules. Mm -hmm. uh, two. Do you want to talk about this? Because I, I find this really, really interesting. Sure. There's two different layout modules. One is called Layout 2013 and one is called Layout 2020. And these are roughly analogous to the original layout in Blink and Layout NG. Essentially, the old engine is more featureful and it supports a much wider swath of the web, but the new engine is cues much more closely to the specification and should have support for properly fragmenting content. Fragmentation is this process of taking different parts of the layout tree and spreading them. For instance, when you have a line breaking, each line is a fragment of that particular node in the layout tree. And then also if you have multi-column or multi-page, you have to like split the, the render node across different positions. And that's something that would have been very difficult with the old layout tree. So th that part at least is similar to the things that other layout, other layout engines are doing, other, sorry, other web engines are doing. And then also we have made this change with regard to parallelization. When you're laying out the web, in general, things can be done in parallel, but there are moments where you have to do things in serial. Things like floats or CSS content, uh, specifically CSS counters, can really make it so that certain things that you're laying out have to be done one after another. And then the old engine, it would try to do everything in parallel. And then when it couldn't, it would sort of drop down to this serial layout mode, which wasn't, you know, it was kind of like the, the fallback mode. But in the new layout system, we've taken this approach where we know ahead of time that some things need to be done serially. So what we can do is as we're walking down the tree, we can do things in parallel till we get to that part that needs serial layout, lay that serially, lay out that out serially. Um, and even like in the descendants of that serial layout, you can switch back to parallel layout. But then also when you come back up and finish the serial layout portion, you can keep laying the rest of the page out in parallel again. So it's like we're getting the benefits of parallelization, but we're not having to do this fallback mode where we, we lose it in case you use a float or use a CSS counter. Now things should be as parallel as possible when they can. And this is a, this engine we're switching to, we're basically trying to finish off the basics of CSS2 um, and essentially remove, at a certain point, we'll be able to remove the old one. Um, and the hope is that, um, that in general, it will be more performant and also much more spec compliant. But is, it's, is it also ragged? Like when we talk about CSS2, um, CSS2 is hard for um, legacy reasons, mm -hmm. but does it have support for, say, CSS Grid? So there's no support for CSS Grid, but it is Flexbox. ragged. It does ragged because it, it does have, yeah, basic support for CSS Flexbox. Right. Um, so it's not to say that we're only going to implement CSS2 first. There are other efforts um, from a lot of basically volunteer contributors to, to implement other parts of CSS3 as well. There's a thing that I would really like to clarify because it is super tricky, actually. Um, as we talk about these things, we talk about like the rendering engine and the JavaScript engine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, now we're talking about this uh, layout. Um, I think this is a layout engine, right? Mm -hmm. Basically, can you help clarify these terms? Because we use them on the show, like as if everyone just mm -hmm. understands what we're referring to. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure they do, or even that I fully do. So, yeah, uh, for sure. So, at the top level, you have this idea of a of a 
I guess you'd say a web engine. And that's something, that's everything basically inside the web view. Um, and that web engine would be embedded into a browser with Chrome and URL bars to control the web engine. Inside the web engine, there are different parts that do different things. And all of these parts kind of have interrelations between the other pieces. Uh, on one hand, you have uh, a network stack and that's the thing that's going to be uh, communicating with a socket to get all the data from the network. And then maybe after that, you have a, a parser, an HTML parser, which turns, uh, which takes the, the data from the socket and turns it into um, DOM nodes. And these DOM nodes are essentially usually little bits of little data structures that, um, that are implemented in native code. And they have essentially a representation into the JavaScript, which is all managed by this JavaScript engine. So this is, this is what's running the script. And every time you touch the DOM, it's going back across the boundary of the JavaScript engine into, into these DOM nodes, which are in, in native code. All that said, um, you also have style. And when the style is parsed by the parser again, it's combined with the DOM nodes that are in, in the, in the native code. And it's given to something called the, the layout engine, which essentially takes these DOM nodes plus style and turns them into uh, a tree of what are called render objects or layout objects. And this is a tree that's very similar to the, the DOM, but um, isn't exactly the same. And once you have all those, those nodes in the layout tree, then you can pass that to the next phase, which is the rendering phase. Um, and typically that involves something like creating a display list and then passing that display list to a rasterizer, which turns those descriptions of um, on-screen elements into pixels on your screen. So I'd say those are the main the main parts of a of a web engine. Yeah, that's really cool to have a nice clear distinction because I know I've heard other people on even other podcasts like say rendering engine. Well, like we very frequently use rendering engine and web engine as interchangeable. But yeah, we're a little sloppy sometimes with the terminology. <laughs> Servo is really a new web engine, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think we refer to it as a new rendering engine a lot of times. Yeah. Um, but it's more than that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. What are you like most excited about? So I think for me, the thing most exciting about Servo is just this idea of the feeling like anything is possible in Servo right now. Um, and it's in a nice moment where if you have a great idea about how to implement a core feature of the web, you can test it out in Servo and see if your idea works. And in Servo, it's just going to be a lot less work than in the other layout engine because there's just less code and there's less people. And I think that feeling of excitement of being able to, to try new things uh, to me is the most interesting thing and the most exciting thing because, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we could see some really novel approaches to, to web engines. Um, I think that because it's rust that is appealing to like a lot of people, it's maybe more accessible than, uh, C plus plus. Do you agree? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, so it's both more exciting and a little bit more accessible. And, you know, how can you not be excited about working on a, you know, groundbreaking sort of project? If you're looking to start something, you want to try to understand and contribute, I would think that this is a great project to, to go see what you can do and, and hack around. And Oh, yeah, for sure. And we're always happy to, like, help new contributors who are interested in, in doing things. We can point you in the right in the right direction as far as setting up your development environment, or if you have if you have a question about what to work on, we have lots of ideas. So one of the things they do on a lot of shows is like 
how can people give you money and support your work? Um, so how, how can people contribute in some way? Like, is it possible to contribute financially? Is it, can they, where, where can they go to find the work if they wanted to develop? Like, is there a get started guide or a contributor's guide or something that you can point them to? Yeah. So the best place to, to get involved either financially or by volunteering time is starting on Soro.org. We have a get involved section, which talks about how to contribute code, um, how to get going, the code of conduct, all that stuff. And then um, there's also the Zulip chat, which is a great place to uh, to come talk to us if you have questions about how anything works in Servo or even just problems getting set up, uh, things you'd like to work on. There's also a sponsorship page if you'd like to, to give money. Currently, it links to the Linux Foundation. Uh, there's a crowdfunding page. And a lot of that money will go toward things like hosting the project's infrastructure, uh, which um, if you've ever tried to host things on a cloud platform, you know that it's not cheap. So so yeah, that's another way to, to help out if you'd like to, to give. And we will actually be launching uh, our own open collective mm -hmm. uh, to support separately our work. Like if you want to contribute to the development and maintenance uh, teams and the teams helping manage the community and everything. That will be a separate collective that will be launching soon. Nice. Okay, Martin, this is, uh, like I said, the second time you've been on the show and I love uh, having you on here all the time. It's always, I learn a lot every time you're on and I think you're a great guest. So thanks for coming on and talking to us about Servo. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. It's been a blast. <laughs>